And now I'd like to welcome to the show uh, Patrice Onwuka, who is director of the Center for Economic Opportunity at the Independent Women's Forum. Welcome, Patrice. Thank you so much. Now, first, can you give our listeners a little background on IWF's Center for Economic Opportunity and the issues you write and work on? Sure. Well, Independent Women's Forum, uh, we exist to uh, talk about you know, expanding freedom and opportunity for, for men and women across the across the United States. You know, we believe in limited government. We believe that you know, individuals are able to you know, really seek prosperity and opportunity when <laughs> the hand of government is, is, is limited. Um, and so at the CEI, or sorry, CEO, which is our Center for Economic Opportunity, we specifically focus on economic, tech, and labor policy. Uh, and so, you know, we find that nice, nice nexus between all where all of those work, whether you're talking about tax policy for small business owners or you're talking about uh, regulations for those who just want to get into the workforce um, at the state level, at the federal level. We kind of cover all of that. And obviously, the economy and the new economy has generated fantastic opportunities, flexible work opportunities for women in particular. And so we really try to push back on those regu those um, the regulations, uh, the legislation, kind of that effort to um, to slow innovation, uh, and uh, and so that can cover everything from antitrust uh, to gig economy leg regulations. Great. Now I'm thinking about the this big picture. You know, one of our main themes on uh, the show here, Free the Economy, is economic opportunity in America, uh, but also sort of uh, culture and attitudes about about capitalism and about a free economy. Now, you're often in the media, all over TV and radio all the time. And given what you hear in the world of public opinion, do you think most Americans still see the U.S. as the land of opportunity? Are, and are we becoming, do you think, more or less optimistic over time? So I think most people see the United States as a land of opportunity. There are pockets where uh, that that view is diminished um, or certainly cloudy. And I think, frankly, it's by narratives that are meant to um, per, to suggest that, it, that the United States is so irredeemably racist or sexist that you know young women, young men, people of color can't break through the barriers, break through um, and 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 achieve their own version of the American dream. But those are pockets. I think most. Most people generally understand that this is the place you want to be if you want to start your small business. This is the place you want to be if you want to rise in the ranks and, and really achieve that middle class lifestyle. Now, that said, I think generationally, millennials and even a little bit Gen Zers, you know, tend to look at their parents and their grandparents and say, wow, I wonder if I can actually accomplish that or achieve that. Um, and and they look at, you know, millennials are a little bit behind the, the eight ball when it comes to home ownership, when it comes to family formation compared to previous generations. That said, people still are on their hustle. People are still looking for ways to uh, achieve what they want to achieve and to maintain a you know, a decent quality of life. And so capitalism, it's, I, I don't think there's a worry that capitalism will ever, ever disappear. But I do think that we have to remind folks that it's speaking as an immigrant and a naturalized citizen, this is the place where you want to be if you want to achieve your dreams. And if you just want to have a good quality life for you and your children. Well, yeah, it certainly seems that if you compare the flow of people wanting to come to the United States with the flow of people wanting to go to Cuba, Venezuela, and North Korea, it's a little lopsided in terms of people still <laughs> wanting to come here. It is. It is. I mean, for, for the very that same reason, I mean, the idea of socialism in theory would be that everyone would have the same outcome. And I think for most people, socialists, it's the outcome of a McMansion life uh, where, you know, you're you've got your Bentley, you've got your great job, you've got your your money, you've got your big house. The reality is um, it would be uh, like a, a Mick 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 big burger kind of life where everybody is living in the same shabby shanties uh, where there's no incentive for someone who is entrepreneuring to risk, take some risks and invest their own capital if they have any. So I think it's important that we spend time educating people to understand that, yeah, you can have in a capitalist society, a, so, a basic social safety net that that's meant to be a springboard rather than a lifestyle. And that's just to, to make sure that everybody is okay, but you don't want 
want everyone to live on in the spring in the in the in the sticky web. You want them to be able to be expanding and, and reaching for higher. Absolutely. Now, we sometimes hear that economic freedom, people wanting, you know, lower taxes, less regulation, much more ability to uh, to make their own choices about money, is that's only useful for people who already have money. That's for rich people and CEOs. But, you know, in episode four, for example, of the show, we talked with Alfredo Ortiz, who's uh, the president of the Job Creators Network. He just wrote a new book. And, you know, his main argument was that economic freedom is especially important for people who are more likely to still be climbing the economic ladder, whether that's Black Americans, Hispanic Americans, recent immigrants, or or anyone who, you know, isn't rich already. What do you think about that? Oh, uh, of course. Occupational licensing is one. Independent contracting is the second example of where people who, you know, you may not have a college degree, people who may be new to this country, people who may have a criminal background uh, and just want to work or start their small businesses, they're being held back by state level and frankly, even federal efforts to kind of shoot to, to protect uh, interests that are already established as businesses that are already established. I'm speaking about occupational licensing or in the independent contracting set, uh, setting, uh, you're trying to protect unions and uh, the traditional uh, work model of work. And so people who don't fit into the traditional model, people who, uh, for example, we speak to women across the country uh, who are home raising their children, but still want to be able to provide some income to the family pot, or women who are rape survivors who cannot sit in, in an office setting and deal with people on a day-to-day a -day basis, but can work at home in the safety in, of their home on their schedule. They need independent contracting. So you can call these people who are marginalized. You can call these people who are locked out of opportunity for whatever reason. These are the people who, who depend upon economic freedom because economic freedom is just saying you should have the, the opportunity to, uh, to, 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 uh, to pursue uh, whatever opportunities you're looking for. And government is setting up barriers. They're erecting hurdles for you to do so, unfair hurdles. And so we as conservatives, we're just saying, and free marketers, we're saying, let's knock down those barriers. You you put in the effort, you run as fast and as far as you possibly can. Maybe you end up with the, the, the CEO life. Maybe you end up as a billionaire or a millionaire. Maybe you just have a quality middle-class life that would be would have been a better life that you had uh, if you lived in another country or a better life than your parents had. Yeah. And then looking forward, again, sort of big picture economic in the economy and economic growth, we have a lot of contentious debates about, you know, managing taxes and federal spending. We've got the, you know, the the debt limit fight we're going forward. There's been a lot of debate on Capitol Hill recently about whether we're going to see reform of uh, mm -hmm. Social Security and Medicare and these, these long-term unfunded liabilities. And it reminds me of something you recently uh, wrote uh, that was, uh, was promoted by uh, IWF. There's a a press release that went out where you said, uh, getting inflation under control can slow the cost pressures on our federal budget, but it's just the tip of the iceberg. Spending cuts and not or entitlement reforms are a must. Now, uh, it should probably come as no surprise to anyone at this point that I, I agree with you. But politically, how do we how do we get there to that that big picture kind of structural economic reform? Yeah, <laughs> I'm probably one of the few people conservatives willing to, to go out on that kind of limb. But I think, number one, it needs to be said. Now, in the short term, there's some battles that you just need to fight. And is the debt ceiling the battle for us to talk about uh, entitlement reform? That may not be. Uh, that's for those who are who are actually negotiating to make that decision. But I, we should at least be talking about it to say that entirely that we just want to just go cold turkey silent and quiet and pretend as though entitlements is not something that needs to be addressed. We're doing a disservice to my kids, to our grandkids, to us as taxpayers. When we start to see the, the automatic changes and frankly to current retirees, when we see automatic uh, payment reductions triggered for retirees within the next few years because we are on this unsustainable path, then it does no one any good not to pretend that we can't, that we shouldn't be having these discussions. So yeah, absolutely. We have to figure out uh, how do you do it? Number one, you talk about it. Number two, in <laughs> you, you probably do. Ideally, when when uh, you've got a House and a Senate that can actually, and and ideally a president uh, who's willing to to go out on a limb and start talking about these things, then utilizing those the, that ideal scenario to really start to push some reforms. And maybe they're small, maybe they're modest, um, but you start to get people, uh, the general public, 
on board with making modest cuts because it has to be done. And I, I would hate to see that, you know, automatic spending, um, automatic cuts and, and benefits kick in for people to realize just how dangerous a position that we're in. That may happen though. Uh, and so we, number one, it starts with talking. Number two, ideally you have the kind of political will uh, you know, and and start to reach across the aisle to those uh, to those on the left who might be sympathetic and maybe are in districts that are more understanding um, <laughs> that that re realize that they need uh, conservative voters as well. But I think voters recognize this. Older voters may not, but certainly younger voters do. That's really interesting. Now, going just beyond economics, I think we've also seen the past several years, we've seen a lot of political realignment in the country, mm. group shifting affiliations and political positions and even what you might call cultural affinities. But to me, uh, one of the ones and and the I've seen one of these biggest changes is the increased skepticism among conservative and moderate parents, I'd say, uh, on their attitude towards government schools, public schools, and and the turn, broader turn towards school choice. You know, when I was a kid, it was basically the conservative church-going moms who were the heart of every public school PTA. And now it mm -hmm. seems like a lot of the women who would have been doing that years ago are now more excited to be homeschooling and charter schooling and starting local micro schools and all sorts of that. What what happened with the the sort of conservative America and public schools kind of seem to be getting a divorce. <laughs> <laughs> I think the pandemic, one of the bright spots, frankly, is that parents were awakened to what their children were learning, how they were being taught as well. Um, you know, I think it's no surprise that you've seen parents really the uprising among parents about, you know, what's being taught in school, the, the specific curricula, starting with uh, you know, CRT or just racial um, biases being introduced in, into the education and then shifting into the gender ideology being introduced as well. And parents were recognizing that they took their hands off the wheel. And the people who took the wheel of public education are driving the car off a cliff. And so They've started to rise up there, but I, but you know, the idea of school choice, I think, was relegated to, to I think, frankly, a few, as you rightly said, some Christian working moms or Christian moms. Now, I think people recognize that you should not. I think there's a greater acceptance that it's not kids who who do work from home, kids who are sorry are in uh, are homeschooled, for example. They're not just kids who are a little bit different or awkward or whatever the case is. They are kids who are extremely bright, intellectual, you know, they and they're being taught by parents who can do it and they're showing that you can do it. So I've been surprised at how many um, suburban moms who look like me who are very much pro school choice or, or pro, pro homeschooling and have pulled their children out even before the pandemic because they wanted greater control over what their kids were learning. So you're starting to see, and these are moms who don't agree with me on a lot of policy areas, um, but they agree with me that their kids, what that the schools are failing their children and that they need to take control over their children's education. And just big picture, that is the message that every policymaker should take away, which is that the government does not own kids, that parents are the biggest stakeholder in their children's education, and they're willing to take the wheel back, which may mean driving their kids out of public school, or it may mean driving the curricula and, and, and taking a greater leadership role. And by the way, the PTA, I think a lot of parents are like, we're not just raising money, bake sales to, to buy, you know, you know, soccer balls. PTA is is these are these tend to be toothless institutions now. We actually need we we care more than just about raising funds for schools if what our kids are being taught is totally uh, against what our values are. So that's that's like what I think is going on. Well, and also you know my you know my intro into this, of course, was to say that you know I think conservatives and conservative parents and conservative moms have become you know less trusting of the public schools. But I also think that, you know, like you said, possibly we can, you know, reach across the aisle and, and comes to entitlement reform. I think this applies in, in both directions. And if you go back to the history of school choice in like the like the late 60s and early 70s, it was it was left wing parents who wanted more school choice. The uh, the idea that was, you know, back then 
was that if you were if you were a hippie mom, you know, you're sending your kids to what you thought at the time was a very conservative institution, you know, and that it was, you know, you know, stunting their uh, their you know, their free thinking abilities and that sort of thing. And so, yeah. you know, far enough back, there were people who had almost the kind of opposite orientation who nevertheless said, you know, I have ideas about what I think is best for my kids and mm -hmm. and more freedom to provide for their education is very important to me. And so, you know, it, the the sort of winds shift in, in terms of what where the sort of cultural politics is at any given moment. And I think a lot of conservative parents reacted to the, you know, uh, closing of schools and things during COVID. And that's sort of the moment we're at right now. But there's a long term, you know, my, my argument is there's a long term um, reaching across the aisle opportunity where you say, well, more education freedom is better for everyone. You can you can have, you know, the 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 Christian Homeschool Association on this side, but you can also have the like the hippie moms on the other side and they can they can both take advantage of more input in their child's education and more educational freedom wherever that leads them. Well, and the idea that the dollars need to follow the child is going to be critical in sustaining this, right? Because um, if you're a suburban parent, if you can afford to put your child in a, in a local pod, if you can afford, um, you know, not to work and to raise your kid, that's great. But no, I, I was a latchkey kid. I, I mentioned that I'm an immigrant. When my family moved to this country, I was just three years old. Um, I, both of my parents were working full time. So I went to a public school. Um, my older brother, who's just five years older, would pick me up and take me home. And, and so I think about immigrant families or I think about, you know, families who don't of whatever race who don't have as much money, but they still want their kids not to be in a failing public school like I had to go to for a while. And so knowing that the dollar follows their kid, oh, it gives them access that parents in the middle class, upper class parents already have and can afford. And so that's, I think, the key to bringing in not just uh, parents across the ideological spectrum, but also for sustaining this uh, this. Um, sustaining this movement beyond just, okay, CRT is out or uh, inappropriate books are out and inter inappropriate curricula is out. Because I think that will diminish over time. But that the idea that the dollars follow the kid, that empowerment is what can transfer from generation to generation. That's excellent. Now, I write a lot about ESG. I'm sure you've you've heard plenty about it, environmental, social, and governance theory and how it applies to uh, to business in the business world. So the biggest ESG issue is probably climate change, but the second is probably diversity, uh, particularly mm -hmm. diversity, equity, inclusion, the DEI initiatives that a lot of big companies have implemented in recent years, and actually not, not even, not so recent years, but uh, heightened attention has been paid to them certainly uh, in the past few years. One big question, uh, these corporate DEI initiatives, do they work? Are they working and are they producing more racial and ethnic harmony and mutual respect? <laughs> so big answer, short answer. I don't think they work. Uh, if the outcome is greater racial harmony, as you're suggesting, do who do they work for? They probably work for those who benefit from the trainings, who are the, the trainers and provide, uh, providing these curriculum. I mean, what's interesting about DEI is uh, and what's different from even past equality uh, type corporate trainings is that uh, there's just this focus on equity, um, that E piece, so it's swapping out equality, which is everyone will not end up in the same place, but they have access to the same opportunities. Equity is saying, no, we're going to get everyone to the same place, even if that means rewarding some um, or punishing others solely based on race. Now, this bottom line, this is discriminatory uh, to treat people differently based solely on skin color or solely on gender, even worse, solely on sexual orientation, all, all of those is illegal and it's wrong. And so I'm looking forward to the challenges to this idea. Um, but, 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 but when we think big picture about, well, how do we expand opportunity for people, particularly those who have been marginalized or disadvantaged from generations, whether you're new to this country or whether your ancestors were brought here in chains. Um, that's a good question. And I think it's important to recognize progress, but also to say the progress is not there. And so uh, Independent Women's Forum actually signed on to an initiative called True Diversity, which is uh, which launch, was launched by the, uh, the Philanthropy Roundtable. And full disclosure, I also work with the Philanthropy Roundtable on this True Diversity initiative because it's saying, okay, 
we're not reflexively anti-diversity. I think we all appreciate that diverse communities, different viewpoints, and not just skin color and gender and race, those physical uh, uh, demonstrations of diversity, but actually diversity of opinion, diversity of background, diversity of socioeconomic uh, backgrounds. That is actually what makes for great, that fosters debates and organizations, that fosters greater opportunities to advance your mission or advance the bottom line. That's fine. But what we see here with a lot of these DEI initiatives is not diversity of thought. It's just basic uh, skin tone, dem demographic diversity. And so uh, I think what you're seeing now is number one, there's a realization that a lot of these DEI efforts don't work. They're not increasing the pipeline of, of, of talent that people, that organizations are looking for, the kind of talent that as a nonprofit uh, achieves the mission or as a for-profit increases the bottom line. They're not seeing that these DEI, DEI initiatives are working to increase harmony. Why actually they dis, they engender distrust between the races. Uh, if you're a minority, you're considered, people think of you as well. We know how she got that job. Uh, and if you're not a minority, you feel like, oh, I'm going to be passed over because you know, such and such person, I don't have the right skin color. That fosters a whole lot of discord in the workplace. And then three, I mean, I just think that some of these uh, initiatives are illegal. Uh, and so uh, what, what we're going to see next, and, our, and, and also the, the fourth piece of it is the market. And so with a lot of corporations scaling back in light of where the economy is um, and spending, uh, you know, uh, revenue is starting to drop for a lot of corporations, they are starting to make cuts. And the, you know where they're cutting? A lot of DEI positions. In academia, we're starting to see DEI positions uh, diminish and that administrative bloat uh, start to disappear uh, in part because these DEI officers feel like nothing is happening and in part because the universities are recognizing they're not turning out you know, uh, students who are are more inclusive or at least more appreciative of, of freedom of thought, it's actually going in the opposite direction. So where do we go here? I think that there are opportunities to continue to ensure, expand our understanding of what DE, of, of what equality should be. Uh, there are ways that companies can and, and ensure that they're building the work workforces and the teams that are are smart, that are achieving mission or achieving the bottom line without uh, creating the discord, creating the uh, discrimination that I think underlies a lot of these DEI efforts. So I'm actually kind of heartened now of what I'm seeing both in academia and the for-profit sector. All right. That's good to hear. And <laughs> And uh, and I know you have a lot of ideas, a lot of great ideas for, uh, you know, increasing economic opportunity in America. But uh, I'm going to hand you a magic wand and okay. I'm going to say you get to pick three new policies that you okay. uh, wave the wand and we just that's they're in they're in they're in force. What are the three things that you would do to expand economic opportunity in America? Number one, um, I want to see every employer take a look at all of the jobs that they have open and determine whether those that require a four-year degree need it. Um, mm -hmm. I think this idea of the, I think it's called a diploma ceiling, um, where people who don't have a four-year degree find that they are capped at how far they can rise. And so states are starting to move in this direction. I think it's going to take corporations and, and private enterprise uh, employers looking and de deciding whether this job actually needs a four year, someone with a four-year degree as certification rather than someone who has experience, someone who could be trained, someone who um, you know maybe chose a different route to their future. That, so that's number one. <laughs> number two, uh, independent contracting. We need to, I would say, uh, the federal and state agencies need to come in line with a, def with a definition of what independent contractors should be from the perspective that all workers are not employees and then you have to prove you're an independent contractor. No. Big picture, we are a nation of entrepreneurs. We are a nation of small business owners. We are a nation of opportunity. And the way you expand opportunity for people who cannot work in, as an employee, um, choose not to work as employee, is to ensure that there is that classification of independent 
contracting. And you can fight misclassification, which I not I don't believe is actually widespread. You could fight that. There, there, there's there are laws and regulations in place to do so. But we need to ensure that Congress, as well as the federal federal regulators and states, are not cr clamping down on independent contracting. That's for women. That's for it's so important for the way the way the way the workforce is moving. And then number three, man, <laughs> um regulations on on entrepreneurs independent of, of of occupational licensing and even independent of independent contracting it's just like those regulations of i want to start a small business in my home i love making cookies my neighbors say i have the best cookies i want to just start my kitchen and then word gets out that my cookies are great i'm doing good business in my garage <laughs> and then some state local person comes knocking on my door and gives me a cease and desist letter why? Because I'm, you know, I've somehow run afoul of some ridiculous uh, regulation uh, that has nothing to do with food and safety or it just doesn't make sense. And so I want to see every state go through all of those zone, if it's zoning related or if it's um, health related regulations that make no sense that are simply there to stop new businesses from forming. And so that I would love to see. I think sometimes we don't need new regulations. I think frankly, we just need to see what works and what is not working and scrap them from the books. So that's what I would do with my, with my magic wand. All right, fantastic. Uh, uh, I, wanna, I wanna see that waved. And, when, <laughs> and in, the, in the future, we will, we'll, I'm sure we will move in that direction. Well, thank you so much for being with us, uh, Patrice. Uh, it was an excellent conversation. And sure. where should where should people look you up to uh, to find all your stuff? Well, first go to iwf.org. That's where a lot of my opinion pieces are written. On Twitter, follow me at Patrice Pink File. I know, old school handle, but Patrice Pink File. Um, and then follow also the Philanthropy Roundtable to learn more about the True Diversity Initiative. Uh, I think it's truediversity.org or go to Philanthropy Roundtable as well. All right. Well, thank you again. And we look forward to seeing uh, all of your excellent content in the future. Terrific. Thank you so much.